You guys, you may be seated. And for everyone wants to leave out of offence that we're charging coffee for two dollars. No, I was just joking. Razzing, razzing. Um, what a week! No, what a week to be alive. Praise God. We, we, <laughs> no, what a what a day to be alive. We've just finished. Come off the back of a week of prayer, and we were able to run prayer meetings all week, every night uh, for seven days. And I just think Zoom has equipped us to be able to gather better. And so we had the upper the upper Zoom room prayer, and it was a powerful time to gather as the church. And so yeah, we feel, we're feeling so blessed and encouraged. And I just Jesus quoted Isaiah, who was quoted. God, which gets confusing, saying that my house would be a house of prayer. And we desire that this house, this church would be a church of prayer. And last week I preached on opening our mouths and the power to open our mouth and speak. And can I just say, Ronan Keating was wrong. You don't say it best when you say nothing at all. It is not true. Ronan was wrong. We need to open our mouths in prayer. The Word of God, it is powerful. It is sharper than a two-edged sword. And so I encourage you, pray scripture. I believe we're going to see this whole church turn upside down if we begin to open our mouths, declare the Word of God, and we begin to pray Scripture. We're going to see a real shift. I saw a shift within my own personal life as I've begun to pray Scripture regularly, faithfully, because sometimes my words don't quite cut it, but when I pray the Word of God, something in my my heart shifts and lifts. Um, Carl, you have a word. I'm going to ask you to come, Carl Williams, and bring this word to the church. Let's welcome Carl. Beep, 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 beep. Morning, church. Um, I spoke to Lou about, I want to share a testimony, and I want to share two scriptures, and I felt God say something to me during the week. So the first scripture is Psalm 55, verse 22, and I'm reading it from the Amplified Bible version. It says, Cast your burden on the Lord, releasing the weight of it, and he will sustain you. He will never allow the consistently righteous to be moved, made to slip, fall, or fail. And the other scripture that I would like to read is 1 Peter chapter 5, Verse 7, it says, Casting all your cares, all your anxieties, all your worries, and all your concerns once and for all on Him. For He cares about you with deepest affection and watches over you very carefully. Over the last three months, many of, well, particularly with my work, I've had a lot of, I would just call them as challenges. And I think. This word this morning particularly is for up, for those who are facing some challenges or some issues of where you're, uh, your employment. And particularly over the last, you know, three months, they were quite, I would say, um, significant challenges that I had to face in the company that I work with. And it impacts you. And any of us who know that as you work in a place of work and there are issues that you're personally dealing with, it can impact you in many ways. It can impact your peace, your sleep, your relationships at home, your relationships at work, and actually how you even function on a day-to-day basis, and it can impact your health. My testimony this morning is God is faithful. God is faithful. So over these three months as I've walked through these things and Linda and I have shared, even at, at home, I can testify God's faithfulness and that He has seen where the issues are quite significant. As the Scripture says, cast all your care on Him and He does care for you. And I felt this week as, as I you know, reflected on, on what God has done over the last you know, three months for in my life and in work and then with Belinda and I, I actually felt God say to tell someone here, whether it's here or if it's online, if you're feeling overwhelmed in a work situation, know that God is there. We sang it this morning about I trust in you. And we sing that, that, you know, that song Waymaker. 
even though I know I cannot see you working, I know you are. And God wants to say that to someone here this morning. If you're overwhelmed in your work and you're facing challenges, God wants you to know that He is there. You may not see Him working. You may not see His hand at work, but know that He is there with you and He will support you and He is there walking with you. So don't be overwhelmed, but know that God is there and that He has your back and He will see you through this. My testimony is such that, you know, I know that God and I trust in Him. But this morning, I believe God wants to say someone here, no, trust in Him and He will be with you everywhere you go. Thanks, Lou. Thank you, Carl. So encouraging. God is a sustaining God. He's a sustaining God. Oh, I just, this morning, I felt to preach out, out of a small section of Scripture in Judges this morning. Now, the book of Judges is a pretty bleak book. It can be a little bit discouraging, and it's a bleak time in Israel's history because they go on this vicious cycle, um, and the cycle is where God gives them what, how they're to live, they fail in that. They live in compromise. They do everything God's told them not to do. So then they face the consequences of their sin. Their enemies are against them. They, then they feel distant from God. They cry out in help. God comes. He rescues them. He raises up a deliverer. Set repeat on the cycle. And they keep going round and round in this cycle. And to depict this time in Israel's history, there's a quote uh, from Isaiah, uh, sorry, Judges 17.6. It says, In those days there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And that really depicts that time and why everything kept swerving to rot. There was no king. God was supposed to be their king. God was supposed to be Israel's king, but there was no king in Israel. They didn't see God as their king and they did whatever was right in their own eyes. It's interesting um, that that comment because we can really relate to that within our culture. It's almost the theme of this culture is for you to do what is right within your own eyes. But what ensured was absolute chaos. When people do what is right within their own eyes, outside of God's plan and purposes, things actually turn to chaos and destruction. And there is a great cost to compromise. So the book of Judges is really the cost of compromise. And it starts off with the fact that they compromised, that God said, empty the whole land. The Canaanites were supposed to be completely eradicated from the land, but they didn't do it to start with. And there's continual effects of their compromise throughout their lives. There's a consequence to compromise. They thought freedom from God would give them freedom. I'll do what I want and I'll feel free. But actually their freedom from God made them a slave to sin and they were a slave to the consequence of their sin. But the hope in this book is that God always has a plan. God always has a plan and he always has a plan of salvation and redemption for his people no matter what they've done. He is so patient and forgiving way more than we are. As we read this book, we think, oh, these people, <laughs> so frustrating. But then we can actually see a reflection of our own lives within their repeat cycle of thinking that their success is their own success. God will deliver them, he'll redeem them, and then they would fall back into their similar patterns of sin. I wanna do a quote Chuck Missler talking about the prophetic aspect of judges. And he said of this book, the world today is living in a period similar to the book of Judges because there is no king in Israel. When presented with their rightful king, they exclaimed, we have no king. This was talking about when Jesus was presented as Israel's rightful king. They said, we have no king but Caesar. Furthermore, people are doing what is right in their own eyes. Value relativism has replaced the rule of God's law in our land. The word of God is neglected. And even in many churches, his word is subject to degeneration, ridicule, and pseudo scholars and critics. And as a result, we are too can fall into bondage rather than living in liberty and freedom when we live under God's rule. 
The encouragement this morning is God always has a plan. He always has a plan. And even in times of history where the tide seems to be completely turned against God's people. And in this season, we can really feel that shift. And we've been speaking for many, many years about really persecution and the cost of being a believer within our nation just really intensifying. And we've even seen that within the media this week and the choice for the football players to not wear the jersey has come with a great cost. And I think there's many people within this church And actually, I want to shout out to many people at home who are sick with COVID. We love you. Praise God for live stream. And we believe for swift recovery for everyone who is sick. Meant to say it before. Now I've cut across my train of thought. Classy move. Um, But as the tide changes, instead of us living in fear or concern about what it's going to look like to be a believer, we need to remember that God always has a plan and he's always raising up a leader (laughs) to respond to what is happening within the culture. So just to give you an idea, judges can be confusing because for us, a judge is someone who sits in a courtroom, who's disconnected with the situation and brings a judgment upon people. And that is not what judges is talking about. Within the context of judges, it's a leader. So when it says God raised up Gideon as a judge over Israel or God raised up Deborah as a judge, it is he raised them up as a leader for his people. So just terminology can be confusing. Sometimes the biblical terms don't fully make sense within our context. So it is he raises up a leader. And this morning, I just really felt to speak on Gideon. I felt to to preach out of a small section of scripture. I love the story of Gideon so much. So I encourage you to go back and read it in its entirety, which I cannot do this morning. But I believe that the Holy Spirit is here and He is doing a great work within your hearts this morning. Would your heart be soft and open to the Word of God? Are you ready for a breakthrough? Are you ready for something to shift within your heart this morning? So I'm going to read from Judges 6. I'm going to jump in and out of it so I don't get heavily stuck um, in just reading the Scripture to you. But I encourage you, if you want to read the whole story. It's found in Judges 6, 7, 8, and 9. You can read, my throat's dry. I think the haze took it out of me this morning. Um, Okay, so Gideon becomes Israel's judge. We come into um, Judges 6, 1. The Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. So that's where they're up to in the cycle. (laughs) They're in a bad place with God again. So the Lord handed them over to the Midianites for seven years. Seven years is a long time. When you read the Bible and we get a time period, don't just read over, oh, seven years. You know, we're like, oh, Joseph was in prison 13 years. Oh, that's a long time. Have you ever been in a hard period in your life for seven years? Have you ever been up against it? I know two weeks of hell is difficult, but what about seven years of oppression from your enemies? So the Midianites, they were so cruel to the Israelites, they made hiding places for themselves in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, marauders, which is like bandits, who knew that's what that word meant? All right, I had to look it up. I didn't know. I was like, what is a marauder? So the, that, that I've, I looked that up for other people like me. So the marauders from Midian and Amalek, they and the people from the east would attack Israel. So they would plant something and it would be taken from them. Whenever they would grow something, it would be robbed. How frustrating. They, they were being completely pillaged. Everything was being taken away from them. And camping the land, destroying the crops as far as Gaza. They left the Israelites with nothing to eat, taking all their sheep and goats and cattles and donkeys. The enemy's hordes coming with their livestock and tent were as thick as locusts. So they just like, just depleted the whole land, took everything that they had. Can you imagine being starvation? Suresh was sharing just this week from their home country country in Sri Lanka. People are literally facing starvation. This is a desperate, devastating situation to be in. It's not a light thing that we're brushing over when we read this this morning. So Israel was reduced to starvation by the Midianites. Then the Israelites, they cried out to the Lord for help. 
And when they cried out to the Lord because of Midian, the Lord sent a prophet to Israel. And we have no context of how this prophet brought this message, but we know that there's a prophet's voice comes to Israel. The Lord sent this prophet and said, this is what the Lord God of Israel says. I brought you up out of slavery in Egypt. I rescued you from the Egyptians, from all those who oppressed you. I drove out your enemies and gave you their land. I told you, I am the God you must worship, the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live, but you have not listened to me. And then we just sort of jump shift. We take a shift and it says, Then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree of Ophrah. I tried a few times to say it out loud. Read it on the screen. Which belongs to Joash, the clan of Abizia. Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of the wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. So every time you prepared food, you had to do it in secret because someone was going to steal it from you. This is a really desperate time. And Gideon would have had servants who could have done this for him, but he was out there doing it on behalf of his family. He was doing something quite significant and noble because he was preparing wheat. He was threshing it. But within the bottom of the wine press, it was like a hole. He was hidden and he was hiding there. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. And there's many other translations, and you may be familiar with this scripture, really familiar. Would you hear it afresh this morning? Many translations I'm familiar with says, Mighty man of valour. Mighty man of valour, God is with you. Mighty hero, God is with you. I just love Gideon's response. He's not like shocked, (laughs) an angel. He just comes straight back. So I, my interpretation, this is just my perspective, is that within his heart, he's praying and having a conversation with God. (laughs) He's, He's contemplating the state of the nation. He's contemplating where is God in this bigger picture. And he says, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened? Have you, ever asked, have you ever asked that question of God? If you are here, why has all this happened? And where are all the miracles that our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us out of Egypt, but now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites? Gideon has an authentic, simple, real conversation with this angel And he has this conversation and he says, where is God? Where are the miracles that we heard about? If we're under this great oppression, then the Lord turned to him and said, go with strength and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I'm sending you. Go with strength and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I'm sending you. That is his response to all the questions. (laughs) Where Where is God and what are you doing? Go and I'm going to send you. I've got a plan. (laughs) I've got a plan and a solution. Go in strength. I am sending you. But Lord, Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe and I am the least in my family. My tribe is the weakest. My clan is the weakest. We're the weakest. We're the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. The Lord said to him, I will be with you, and I will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. Gideon replied, If you truly are going to help me, show me a sign to prove that it is really the Lord speaking to me. Don't go away until I come back and bring me my bring my offering to you. He answered, I will stay here until you return. It's interesting, the angel of the Lord says, if you really are God, just wait here. Then he goes and he prepares a meal. Do you know how slow it would be to kill a goat? I don't even want to know how long it takes to kill a goat and prepare it for a meal. I don't want to know. It's something I'd rather not be aware of, of how long that meal takes. I know how long it takes me to make a basic spaghetti bolognese. Too long. That The Lord waits for Gideon to go back to his home, prepare this offering and bring it before him. 
And then he carries the meat in a basket and the broth in a pot and he brought them out and presented them to the angel who was under the great tree. And the angel of God said to him, place the meat and the unleavened bread on this rock and pour the broth over it. Gideon did as he was told and the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the bread with the tip of the staff in his hand and fire flamed, come on, upon the rock and consumed all he had brought and the angel of the Lord disappeared. Love it. This sort of stuff is exciting to me when you really read it. As, as it, if you imagine you're Gideon, then Gideon realises and maybe he's thinking I've been too casual with the angel. And he's like, oh, I've seen the angel of the Lord. I think I'm going to die. <laughs> I'm doomed. <laughs> I've seen the Lord face to face. I'm dead. This, oh, you know, maybe he regrets making the angel wait for him to prepare the goat. He thinks maybe I went too far. And then the Lord comes to him and says, don't be afraid. You will not die. And then Gideon Gideon built an altar, come on, the Lord there and named it Yahweh Shalom, which means peace. He built an altar, which means God is peace and the altar remains there today. Gideon is someone most of us can connect with. I, don't, I think I know why Gideon is, the, is such an iconic story for all of us is because we can relate to the unlikely leader that Gideon is. We can relate to Gideon's authentic and simple prayer before God, his conversation with the angel. But most of all, we can relate to Gideon's assumption of himself. This morning, the main key point that I believe God wants to speak to us this morning is sometimes your read on you is wrong. Sometimes your read on you is wrong. God comes to Gideon and he calls Gideon as he sees him. Not as his becoming, but God sees Gideon as he truly is. Mighty hero, mighty man of valour. He calls Gideon as he is. And Gideon comes back to the Lord and says, no, 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 (laughs) you've got it wrong. My clan is the weakest. Like we're at the bottom of the food train. We're the worst. In the arm wrestles, you know, when, when we're fighting, we always come off worse. We are the weakest clan in the whole tribe. And then if you go to the family I'm the, I'm the weakest, I'm the least in my family. Have you ever felt that within your family? What is your assumption of yourself? Your read on yourself can quite often be very, very wrong. God comes to Gideon and he says, mighty man of valour, mighty hero, God is with you. He calls him as he is. This morning, I want you to just comprehend and open your heart. Who does God say you are when he calls you, when he speaks to you? Because when we speak to ourselves, I don't want to know what you say to yourself. It's probably pretty mean because I know I can be really mean to myself. My assumption of myself can be even worse than what Gideon believes about himself. When God calls you by name, what does he say? Connie, mighty woman of courage, of discernment. He calls us as we are. He sees who we are, who he's created us to be. You know, we have certain people in our lives, we have some people who see us as we were. This is a generational church and I'm grateful that people have let me grow up. I've had to grow up embarrassingly in front of everybody. People are like, I remember when you used to preach, when you were younger, it was pretty rough. I was like, I know. But thank you that people don't, there's people that don't just see me as I were. Then there's some people that see you just as you are right now. I see exactly who you are within the context of who you are. But when we're engaged with God, and this is where prophecy is so important, because when we're around people that are engaged with God, they actually see who we are called to be, the potential of who we've been called to be. Gideon is called mighty man of valour, mighty hero. What does God say to you? Who does God call you? Not as who you are becoming, but who He has created you to be. How does God see you? 
What does he say about you? He has something to say, but I promise you it's not mean. We say mean things about ourselves. I'm the worst, I'm the dumbest, I'm the most incapable. God doesn't say that about me. God sees who we were, who he's created us to be and who we're becoming. He calls us into the potential. You know, your read on you could be totally wrong. In fact, most of my experience within my ministry life is our assumption of ourselves is wrong. As I get close to people, I think, you see yourself like that? That's what you see? Do you see what God sees? Do you see what God sees? It's really important for us as the people of God to see what God sees in other people, not just within ourselves, but call it out in other people. I think the song, I am who you say I am, is powerful because most of us forget. Who, we, we, we find it really easy to think, yep, I'm a sinner. <laughs> yep, I fall short. We find that easy. But who does God say you are this morning in Christ? Do you know that? Do you know who you are in Christ? Do you know what you have access to? Pastor Rick reminded of us that the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in me. How do we see ourselves? Mighty hero, God is with you. Those two things are not small. God being with us is not a small thing. I am who I am because of him, because of Christ, because of Christ in me. I'm more than a conqueror. I'm an overcomer. I have access to every spiritual blessing because of who Christ is in me. Your read on yourself could be wrong. God has a plan. Even as Israel continually turned their back on God, he had a plan to redeem them and he was going to use Gideon and he is calling Gideon and he calls Gideon out of obscurity. And I believe God is calling us this morning out of obscurity, out of the hiding place, out of the place in which we see ourselves of like I'm, I'm the lowest, you know, even he's calling us as a church out of obscurity. And he calls us as he sees us. He says, East Coast, you Holy Spirit filled church, you worshipping church. He calls us as he has created us to be. You read on yourself can be wrong. Gideon asked, How can I go? God said, I will go with you. That's not a small thing. That is not a small promise that God is with us. I will be with you. Jesus promised that he will be with us. He will be with us till the end of the age. It is no small thing that the creator of the universe has promised to be with you, that the Holy Spirit has come to be our comforter. When you receive Jesus, we have living God dwelling within us. That is no small thing. I will be with you. The Bible is full of these truths, but if we don't know it, we are consumed with inferiority. We are consumed with rejection. We, be, we become consumed with these fears. And that, and, and even the present reality as it is, my family is the weakest. Maybe that's true. Maybe they were the weakest. And maybe he was the least. The thing I know about God is he loves to use the weakest. <laughs> And he loves to use the most unexpected. He actually loves to do that. Why does he always choose the youngest within the family? He loves to use the unexpected to prove that he is God. Who does God say you are when he calls you by name? Because I know he has called you by name. And we're not just here playing church. We are a part of revealing God to this generation. Do you know this generation needs to know God afresh? In Judges, it says a whole generation raised up that didn't know the miracles, the works and the goodness of God. And that's how they swerved to rot. This generation needs to hear afresh about the message of God. And we've got to know who we are in Him. We have to be aware of who we are. Are in Christ. 
When I first came to this church, I can take you back to multiple times of coming on the altar, to being in prayer meetings when people prophesied over me things that I did not see within my life whatsoever. But God used people to call out where God was taking me. I remember the first time someone prophesied and said, you're a leader. I could have fallen over. I just thought I never saw myself as a leader. I never saw that on myself. I remember being prophesied, you're Ruth, you're faithful, God is going to call. And I remember I was in the back when like no one showed up to the Tuesday morning prayer meeting and I was coming and I got that word and I remember thinking, wow, have you ever received a word and God has awakened you to actually what is within you, who you truly are? When someone opened their mouth and spoke and that which was not there Well, it's there, but I was able to see it. The power of words. It's life and it builds us up. And God gives us the ability to see that in others. And it's powerful when you call it out. Authentic encouragement. Don't go go around blowing smoke, right? That's the worst. I hate when people just say stuff because it sounds fluffy. No, but... I could just begin to pray. And when I begin to pray over people, you know, I was thinking about Tega and just thought, you know, you can just, I could just pray over Tega and I say, she's a mighty woman of God and she has evangelism. The gift of evangelism is on her. I can just begin to pray over each person here and I get a sense for what God sees in them. I can see in the natural, but when I begin to pray in the spiritual and tap into what God sees, Sometimes our read on ourselves can be wrong. And it's all through the Bible. God calling out who we really are. Changing people's names, wiping out our past. He used prostitute Rahab. She ends up in the lineage of Jesus. Incredible. This is our God. Now, I want to just highlight before... I wrap up this morning. Maybe, Maddie, I'll get you to jump up for me. A guy called Robert Morrison. Has anyone heard of Robert Morrison, a missionary? I've got one person nodding. Oh, yeah. So Pastor Mark, if you've been here for a long time, you may be familiar with this story, this man, Robert Morrison, and he desired to be a missionary in China in the late 1800s. Like a little side note about his story, his mum said... Promise me you will never, in my living life, you will never be a missionary. She died three years later because God had called him, I thought. That was just a bad promise because that God had called him. And if you're going to have to be shifted out of the way, that's what happened. She was like, over my dead body, basically, and that happened. It's like within, as you're reading his biography, that you think, oh, don't get in God's way of God's plan. Um, she did, they, they were devastated that he wanted to be a missionary. Um, anyway, that well, I just thought sometimes I find things comical. That Not that she died, but I just thought, you know. He becomes an expert. We've got to think it's in the late 1800s. Like it's hard to fully imagine what China was like, but it wasn't open. <laughs> it was not open to the West or to missionaries whatsoever. And the style of missionary was to come in with, with your English ways and, and enforce... Um, English upon the other cultures. And so what's quite incredible about what Robert Morrison did was he became an expert in Chinese language and he became an expert translator. And he translated, think about how smart he must have been, a Latin Chinese dictionary completely. So he did that completely. And then he translated the whole of the New Testament. So there was no Chinese Bible at this time. Robert Morrison translates the Word of God into Chinese. This guy was so proficient in Chinese, he was able to write poetry and um, theatre, which is you really need to understand culture and humour to be able to do that. That's how proficient he was in the Chinese language. He also was very unusual and they considered him eccentric because he would dress as a Chinese man and he got a fake ponytail and he would fully immerse himself as a part of the culture. This man, Robert Morrison, dies at the age of 52 in his son's arms. It will be another eight years before missionaries arrive in China and will use his dictionary and Chinese Bible. It's eight years after his death before the the missionaries will arrive and use the Bible in which he translated. Morrison could know nothing of the great future ahead. And before his death, he was nearly overcome with despair. 
what was the use of all of his work when in 10 years labour showed a result of only 10 Christians? He won 10 people to the Lord. It's like historically documented, he baptised 10 people and he was despairing. According to his own mathematical calculations, 100 years of effort could only yield 100 converts and he was in despair. Morrison wrote in his diary, not long before he died, I have failed. His assumption and read of himself was completely off. (laughs) He felt his whole life's work, he'd failed. He felt he was a failure. By 1934, only 100 years later, so he dies 1834, 100 years later, the Bible was in every province of China 58 million Chinese Christians by 1993. And that's an only an estimate because most of the Chinese church is underground and it's underground nature. Some even saying more. Sometimes our read on ourselves can be fully off. That just broke my heart. Here's this man who his life's labour fully paved the way for a nation to receive the Word of God. But his assumption of himself was he's failed. He's failed. There was this incredible quote where he got on the boat and um, they didn't even, don't you love how God does this? They didn't even want to let this guy on a boat (laughs) to go to China. They wouldn't release him as a missionary. And the ship's captain said to him, oh, so you think you're going to make some impact and, and win people for God in China? And he goes, no, I don't think I will, but I believe God's going to do a great work. Where are you missing that the hand of God is upon you? (laughs) Your read on yourself could be wrong. I just want to encourage us this morning and as you read Gideon to yourself, God was so patient with Gideon and that encourages me. He was patient with Gideon to prepare that meal for him. But if you're familiar with the story, Gideon puts out two fleeces for God, in which it's not encouraged to fleece God, but he's like, okay, God, if you're going to be with me and we're going to win this battle, I'm going to pull out this sheepskin and overnight, if that's wet and the ground's dry, then I'll know you're with me. So that next morning, the sheepskin's wet and the ground is dry and he's like, okay, don't be angry, but can you do it again the other way around? Have you ever felt like that when God's called you to do something and you're like, okay, God, I really sense this is you. Don't be mad, but I feel like I need a bit more encouragement. Don't be mad. God is God was so patient with Gideon and God is patient with you. And there is a great call upon all of our lives individually. And He calls you by name and He calls you as you are. Not just as who you are becoming because how God sees you is how He created you. And He sees what He is doing through you. Gideon does step up to be the mighty hero and he trusts God. What's incredible is even when there was too many warriors, God says to him, you've got too many people in your army, 22,000. It's going to look like you guys won because you're strong. So I want you to send home everyone who's afraid. So then it's reduced to 10,000 people. I'd be starting to feel a bit nervy at this point. But he's trusted God up to this point. There's 10,000 people in the army. God says, there's still too many. God loves to win a battle with a few. (laughs) Says there's still too many, still going to look like you guys did this in your own strength. How about everyone who drinks the water like a dog, you know, bit judgy, but no, jokey, jokey. But, you know, send them home. But those who cup the water with their hand and they've still got access to the weapon, keep them. It left him with 300, 300 people. But do you know what is incredible about the way the story goes? God knows Gideon is feeling a little bit nervous. And he says to Gideon, you go down to the camp and listen to what they're saying. So they sneak down and they're listening to the tent and there's two guys in there and guy goes, oh, guess what? I had a dream last night. It's a weird dream. A loaf of bread falls on the tent and crushes it. And, and the guy goes, oh, that's an interesting dream. He goes, I believe that interpretation of the dream means that the is- God's given the Israelites victory. Gideon's going to crush us and we're all doomed. Gideon hears this and he says, thank you, God, I'm really encouraged now. And he goes back to the army and he leads them into victory. 
Sometimes I think we think God can't handle. I, Gideon is an iconic story because we can relate. How we see ourselves, how we second guess hearing from God. God is with you. God was patient with Gideon and God is patient with you. The big picture plan is that God has a plan and a purpose for this generation. Would you close your eyes as we pray? Would you forget what has been? And what I mean is like, it's we can't, and I think Gillian really had a word about not looking back. And we, we can't look back about what's happened. We can be encouraged about what God's done in the past, but forget what has been because we are accountable as to how we live now as God's people. We are in a raising up season as the church and God is calling Gideons and Daniels and Esthers to rise up. And His plan is salvation of cities, of nations, that all would know that Jesus came and died and rose again so that all believe in Him will have eternal life. And He's calling us out of obscurity and He's calling us out of this seemingly hidden place within Tarim Point right now. He's calling us individually and He's calling us as a church to rise up. He has a plan and a purpose over this generation. And He calls us as He sees us, that you are a son and a daughter of God, that you have access to every spiritual blessing, that you are completely forgiven. Someone needs to hear that this morning. You are completely forgiven in Christ Jesus. Would you receive that forgiveness? There's someone in this room and you are, you are not forgiving yourself. And that is cutting you off from the access to be able to hear who God says you are. Would you be set free right now in Jesus' Name? There's a spirit of inferiority and rejection And you wear it as a coat of armour in the sense that your inferiority and your rejection define you. You relate so deeply with Gideon and you say, "That's, that's me, I'm the inferior one. And God is saying, mighty man and woman of valour, mighty warrior, I have called you by name and I am with you. It's time to rise up and cast off the ways in which you've seen yourself before. It's time to step out of the past into into who God has called you to be. Where rejection has shattered someone's heart in this room, where you feel a deep sense of abandonment, I pray the Holy Spirit would minister to you right now. Thank you, God, that you can heal a broken heart. Thank you, Lord. And I pray that this would be a community where we call out the truth of who you see us to be in each other. We see that you would give us prophetic eyes in this place to see ourselves and this church as you have called us to be. Thank you that your name is victory, that you have a plan and we wanna partner with you with your plan within this generation and that we will see a multitude come to Jesus. Would you stand to your feet? I forgot, maybe we could just um, just have the worship team up. And... I don't want to close the service without an opportunity for prayer. And if you want to come forward for prayer, we would love to pray for you. Significant moments have shifted within my life when I've been on the altar. You know, when your heart's just been, you think I need to go down for prayer. The breakthrough comes when you just go. I think it doesn't even matter what anyone prays for you, but I think just responding when God says, hey, go down for prayer, respond to what, God, what I'm saying to you. That's where I find the shift comes in just walking. That's the brave move, that move. That's when God, I feel the breakthrough comes through obedience. 
would we be obedient to the nudges of the Holy Spirit and will we see the flow of the Holy Spirit in our lives? We're gonna finish in a time of worship and we're just gonna sing. Looks like you're gonna leave. No, here comes Rio. I was gonna say you're on Karen. And um, as we close out the service and then coffee is in the backyard, you're welcome to join us. Hang around and chat to somebody after the service. God bless you.